Hi folks, this is Douglas Bond coming at you from the Scriptorium, live here in the Scriptorium. On uh, Veterans Day Observed, yesterday was the centenary of the armistice, the signing of the ending of World War I. Tragic war. Um, C.S. Lewis, a uh, young teen atheist, angry, bitter, writing uh, blasphemous poetry and shaking his fist at the God that he said didn't exist, um, uh, was a uh, uh, was a, t a teenager. Um, he turned 19 his first day uh, in the trenches, November 29th, 1917, and uh, would go on to be wounded uh, April 15th, uh, 1917. And uh, out of action, got the million dollar wound. That meant that he was still intact, all in one piece with arms and legs and all of his uh, faculties, but, um, uh, but with a, a chunk of shrapnel near his heart for the rest of his days. You know, uh, it really affected Lewis. Uh, Lewis said that uh, the things he saw in war, he couldn't, he couldn't forget. He didn't talk a whole lot about it. A chapter and a few uh, paragraphs or so in his uh, spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy. But he says this, the war, the frights, the, the cold, the smell, the horribly smashed men still moving like half-crushed beetles, the sitting or standing corpses, the landscape of sheer earth without blade of grass, the boots worn day and night till they seem to grow to your feet. I have gone to sleep marching and awoken again and found myself marching still. Familiarity with the very old and the very recent dead, I came to know and pity and reverence the ordinary man. Lewis uh, was in a furnace. He was being refined, as it were. He was, he was not a Christian at this time. His first book, Spirits in Bondage, published uh, while he was still 19, would be... Uh, would be uh, really a diatribe in verse uh, against God, much of it, uh, and his bitterness and angry, anger against the God who he said didn't exist, but who he needed to blame for all the horrors that he saw in World War I. Some say as many as 31 million lives lost, uh, a whole generation of young men. And we, uh, we remember of that. It's critical that we remember these things. If we fail to remember them, we have historical dementia and uh, the very worst of our history we will repeat and we'll probably be the aggressors in doing so. Um, <clears throat> interesting, fascinating world war. Uh, interesting, I don't like the word, it's almost dead now, but, but it, it is a fascinating uh, conflict, worldwide conflict, begins with the assassination of an archduke, uh, Austria-Hungarian archduke, Sarajevo. And that set off a whole chain of uh, events uh, that would lead to uh, the, the horrors of uh, a war of attrition uh, in which so many young men would die. There was a whole generation uh, of decline, huge decline in, um, in births simply because there weren't enough males uh, to marry. There were many, many young women in England and Scotland and France <clears throat> who uh, just simply didn't have anybody to marry. And they lived out their days as spinsters. Um, I met uh, some of them um, uh, in years past. Hardly anyone living that was uh, uh, a combatant, certainly in World War One, uh, and um, and only a few with memories from uh, World War One. Spent some time there, uh, numerous times, but uh, led a tour of folks there in uh, June on the Armistice Centenary Tour. A marvelous gr group of people. We had just such a, a wonderful time. It was very sobering. Uh, almost half young people, and it was it was really it was really heartening to me to see these young people taking it in and really feeling it, and uh, not being able to talk, not trusting themselves to talk uh, because of what they've just seen and heard. Uh, they're at Tiepval, uh, the memorial, the British memorial to the, the darkest day in British military history. Opening day of the Battle of the Somme, July 1st, <clears throat> 1916, when uh, they had 60,000 casualties. The British Army had 60,000 casualties, nearly 20,000 dead one day in a battle that would go on for five months. J.R.R. Tolkien said that at the end of the war, uh, all but one of his friends had died in the war. 
Tolkien wasn't wounded. He actually uh, got a bad, bad case of trench fever and uh, was out of combat because of uh, the, the illness. Trench fever, trench foot, those were the common ailments uh, in the trenches. Uh, some of the wettest, uh, coldest um, uh, winters uh, happened during 1914 and 1918. And it took their toll uh, in the health of the men uh, who were struggling in that great conflict. Uh, when uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, when he uh, announced in Berlin uh, the mobilization of German troops to begin, that was August 1st, 1914. When he announced that, uh, they broke into song, uh, the German people did. And uh, the, the song that they sang was a hymn, a marvelous hymn, one of my favorite hymns from a German Lutheran pastor by the name of Martin Rinkert. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things have done in whom his world rejoices. Uh, it's a glorious hymn to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the midst of great struggling and conflict, another war. Um, 300 plus years before the 30 years war, uh, Martin Rinkert, a pastor, earnest, godly, gospel-centered, Christ-centered pastor, there uh, performing funerals. That became his first and chief uh, pastoral duty for uh, a number of those years. Um, in the year that he wrote that uh, hymn in 1636, there's still 12 more years of the 30 years war to go. Uh, he had buried his wife and his six children, and uh, yet he pens the uh, the quintessential Thanksgiving hymn. Perhaps Thanksgiving doesn't really mean very much unless you are clinging to Christ, as uh, Katharina Van Bora put uh, after the death of her husband, uh, Martin Luther, and nearing her own death uh, from a, uh, a mortal injury that she had falling from a cart, <clears throat> fleeing uh, another war, um, there uh, that affected Wittenberg. She said, I cling to Christ like a burr to cloth. And that was Martin Rinkert. Um, not Lewis during World War I, though. Lewis was an angry, bitter teen atheist. Later in World War II, he would be the chief apologist uh, of the 20th century, and he would become the voice of faith on the BBC. They would seek him out <clears throat> because of his space trilogy, because of his book, The Problem of Pain, he would be sought out by the BBC to um, speak. Uh, they didn't want a bishop. They didn't want a cleric. They wanted somebody who had a, an ability to communicate Christian truth in a way that could be understood by uh, the average listener. So they to choose one of the best read men of the 20th century, one of the highest intellects of that century, C.S. Lewis. And uh, he was gifted by the Lord to be able to, to communicate. Um, in uh, 1931, he fell at the feet of Jesus and called him Lord and God. Uh, a year and a half or so before that, he was a reluctant convert to theism on an intellectual level. But it would be uh, 18 months or so later that he would become a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ by the grace of God and the Spirit of God's work in him. But uh, Lewis said some very interesting things when he heard uh, about the invasion of Poland by the National Socialist uh, Party's uh, troops, the Nazi Party, Hitler, um, in September of uh, 1940. Uh, uh, Lewis put it this way, he says, My memories of the last war haunted my dreams for years. Military service includes the threat of every temporal evil, pain and death which is what we fear from sickness, isolation from those we love, which is what we fear from e exile, the toil under arbitrary masters, which is what we fear from slavery, hunger, thirst, and exposure, which is what we fear from poverty. I'm not a pacifist. If it's got to be, it's got to be. But the flesh is weak and selfish. I think death would be much better than to live through another war, said Lewis. But he would go on and be so recognized on uh, the BBC radio that he would be called the voice of faith. Uh, all of mere Christianity uh, would come out and um, in increments uh, in his broadcast talks, which is what the first volume was called when it was released in in Britain uh, in 1942. Uh, it was called The Case for Christianity in America when it was released in 1943, added to uh, with subsequent broadcasts throughout the rest of the war uh, in uh, what would become uh, Mere Christianity, uh, released as a book in 1952. 
I've had a delightful time with the research. It's heavy. It, it, it weighs down on me. I remember when I was researching for uh, my World War I uh, book called War in the Wasteland, uh, which, which is set in C.S. Lewis's um, platoon, uh, second lieutenant C.S. Lewis uh, with Sar dear Sergeant Ayers, as he called him, one of the squad leaders of a private in uh, Sergeant Ayers' squad. But as I was reaching for uh, researching for, I was reading all these memoirs from World War One. I, I couldn't sleep. My wife, she gets these things. She says, "Well, of course you can't sleep." You sat there reading memoirs from World War One for two and a half hours before you went to bed. Of course you can't sleep. He calls them my manias, probably accurately. I've just completed. In fact, it's still uh, only in uh, the page proofs. This is what it looks like before the book comes out. I just dropped it, but here's the cover. Um, uh, to that book. It'll be out any day and available. Pre-orders are, are being taken now as, as, as we speak, and there's a special for pre-orders. So get your get your foot in the door and you'll save a little bit of money. Free shipping, signed copies coming out uh, as soon as those things come in the, in the door. But um, um, one of the fun things about this and why I call these two companion volumes, uh, War in the Wasteland and the Resistance uh, here. I, I call them companion volumes because C.S. Lewis features in this one as an angry, bitter teen atheist. In the Resistance, he features as the voice of faith. And you see the powerful transformation of the Spirit of God over those two decades or so in between the wars. Um, but Lewis um, would be that voice. And one of the things that they did was he had to script exactly what he was going to say. It couldn't deviate uh, a whisker from anything he was going to say because if he did, uh, the censors, you know, from Bletchley House and all of that would come in and they would halt the broadcast. And they had to do that from time to time. Uh, everything had to be scripted because there were fifth column uh, double agents in Britain and uh, they could be sending coded messages embedded in the, in the broadcast talk. Uh, as I read about that, my oldest daughter, she just turned 30 the, the other day. And I just turned 60 the other day. So we're, you know, half, half, she's half my age. But uh, she got me a book uh, a while back. I don't have it right here in front of me or I'd show it to you, but it's called Lewis in Time of War. Fascinating story of the, the saga of really choosing C.S. Lewis and all of the correspondence between the BBC from Broadcast House and all, and uh, Lewis, um, and all of the, 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 the uh, intricacies of, of broadcasting during wartime, Radio London. Interesting thing is that uh, I discovered in there is that the French resistance got their coded messages from listening into uh, the, uh, the BBC broadcasts. Uh, one of the first things that the SOE, the MI9 agents, would drop into uh, the various resistance cells in France, occupied France, was an RCA radio so that they could tune in to Radio London. So that gave me a thread throughout the uh, rising action of the yarn uh, that would uh, to, uh, that, that would give me snatches of C.S. Lewis's voice. Like, a, you know, the author gets to choose those snatches. But throughout the story, there, there's these uh, snatches they hear, they debate, they discuss, they argue about uh, as, uh, as, the, as the, those are coming, the, the gospel is coming to their, to their mind and their thinking. Uh, themes about prayer. In fact, the only audio of Lewis's voice from those broadcast talks that has survived is his address from, I believe it was March in 1944, on uh, prayer. And uh, I use some excerpts uh, from that. I have uh, I have a uh, uh, C.S. Lewis uh, look-alike and sound-alike that I discovered who has read uh, some of the excerpts that appear in uh, The Resistance. And uh, we'll have a series of audio and video that will be coming out with uh, Richard Pike from Western Australia, but, uh, but British-born, English-born, uh, who looks an enorm enormously like uh, C.S. Lewis and sounds a lot like him as well. So you can look forward to those. I appreciate you listening in. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I appreciate that. Go to bondbooks.net. Subscribe there. You can hear about special deals and special events we're having, as well as tours. We have an English and, uh, and Scotland uh, Reformation tour coming up in June, and regular uh, uh, enrollments and uh, registrations for that. It's filling uh, rather rapidly. And I'd also like to uh, invite you, ins aspiring writers, to join me in Oxford uh, April 2nd through the 9th for the intensive 
Oxford Creative Writing Masterclass. It's the next one. I'll have another one in June. Uh, but we have so much fun and so much productive time on those. More about that coming soon. But subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to bondbooks.net. Thank you for listening in uh, to uh, Douglas Bond on the Scriptorium video version.